So my talk will consist of, of two parts, uh, uh, a more introductory part to level linear Herklotz functions, and some of what I'm going to talk about, you will already have heard it in uh, Anne-Marie Lugo's talk, but uh, I, I suppose it doesn't matter to repeat a few things. So, uh, <coughs> Uh, in, in the first part, uh, it will be uh, about two things. Say holomorphic functions in a domain with a non-negative real part or non-negative imaginary part. And then I will speak about the class of completed monotonic functions. And in the second part, uh, I will speak about a, a recent paper written together with two uh, friends from uh, Brazil, um, Eugenio Massa and uh, Anna Peron. And uh, it's, it's concerning uh, this family of functions depending on a complex parameter alpha. So to start, there is uh, the famous theorem of Herklotz from 1911. Uh, it's about holomorphic functions in the unit disk having non-negative real part. And he, he found the integral representation of these functions as precisely the functions written in the formula. It depends on a real number beta, and it depends on a positive measure mu on the unit circle. So that is the, the boundary of the unit disk D. And uh, that's a small picture of uh, Herklotz. We have already seen it also yesterday. Something very similar uh, is behind the next thing, because we replace the upper half plane, uh, the unit disk by the upper half plane, uh, just by a conformal mapping. And, and then uh, the formula of Herklotz is transformed into uh, the, the formula for peak functions, or herklotz nevalina functions, or R functions. They have many, many names, because they have been used in many different uh, contexts. And uh, so <coughs> these are the functions which are holomorphic in the upper half plane and having non-negative imaginary part there. And uh, we have also seen this formula before. It depends on three things. An arbitrary uh, real number, an arbitrary non-negative number alpha, and then an arbitrary finite measure on the real line. And so these are, so to say, for each real number, you have a, a basic uh, Herklotz Neverlinner function, and then you mix them using uh, the, the finite measure on the real line. And uh, there are at least two mathematicians behind this, this formula. There is uh, Neverlinner, and there is Pick. Now, using a, a simple identity, we can transform the previous formula to the following formula, which was also given by Anne-Marie. Well, she put a, a factor 1 over pi here, but that's, of course, just the scaling of the, of the measure. And uh, it's easy to calculate the imaginary part of this expression. So this will just give you, you this. And, and this expression, uh, certainly with the factor 1 over pi, is the so-called Poisson kernel from the upper half plane. So it is clear from this formula that these functions have a non-negative imaginary part. And it's also easy to see how you find the alpha and beta and, uh, and the measure from the function. The alpha is the limit of this expression when you go to infinity on the imaginary axis. The beta is just the value uh, real part of the function at the point i, and uh, I mean <coughs> for fixed positive y, the imaginary part of f is a positive uh, continuous function, and then uh, you consider that as a density with respect to Lebesgue measure, so you have a, a family of measures indexed by y, and you go to the limit, 
then the measure sigma is the so-called vague limit of these densities. And uh, let me recall what that means. You integrate a, a function against the measure sigma. It's just the limit of these things, and that's valid for all continuous functions with compact support on the real line. There's a small uh, addition to say here. Say if this function, the imaginary part, so to say, has an, a nice limit when you tend to the real line, <coughs> and uh, you get this limit function s of x, uh, say it exists uniformly on compact sets in some open set i, then. Uh, the restriction of the measure sigma to this uh, open set i has, in fact, uh, a density uh, with respect to the Lebesgue measure given in this way. So, so that's very useful when you want to, to calculate uh, the measure if it has a density. We also note that the peak function automatically extends to the, uh, to the lower half plane, or to say, say the complex plane minus the real axis, using this uh, formula. So let me give some examples. So, so first of all, I use uh, n for Nevalina, for the nevalina herklotz functions. So the set of all these functions is a convex cone. And also, a peak function is either a real constant, or it satisfies that the imaginary part is strictly positive for all points. So in other way, this is the so-called uh, the, de the degenerate case when f is a real function, and the non-degenerate case, the most important, then it maps actually the upper half place into itself. And that means that if you have two non-degenerate peak functions, then we can compose them to get a new one. So that's a very important property. And uh, this also means that if you have a non-zero uh, Herklotz function, then minus 1 over f is uh, again a function in our class. You can also say that it corresponds to minus 1 over z is actually a peak function. We also saw this example in uh, Anne-Marie's lecture. Uh, here I just uh, give the measure, this is Lebesgue measure on the negative part of the real axis. And this is a so-called principal logarithm. If you take uh, a fractional linear transformation coming from a matrix uh, uh, real numbers with determinant 1, then this is again a peak function, because you can easily calculate the imaginary part, is this expression. Here are some more examples uh, set to a power between 0 and 1, defined in, in, this, in this way, to be precise, is also a peak function. The tangent, we already saw that also in Anne-Marie's lecture, is a peak function, and uh, it's explained by this simple formula. Here are some more complicated functions in terms of the uh, classical gamma function. They are actually also peak functions, and that was proved uh, some years ago by Henrik Petersen and, and myself. And <coughs> you could say, why do you consider such a, a function? Well, it was because uh, the volume of the unit ball in Euclidean end space is uh, this quantity, and uh, there was a lot of work going on to look at the asymptotic behavior of, uh, of this expression. And that could be done using peak functions. Uh, Henrik Petersen and some of his co-authors uh, replaced these things by replacing the gamma function by more uh, elaborate uh, gamma functions of a higher order. I will not go into what it is, and maybe he will tell about it. Now I will consider some, some very special peak functions which are called Stilte's transforms. So if you have a, a positive finite measure on the real line, 
you consider this expression, and it's called a Stilges transform, or sometimes a Cauchy transform. And uh, this is certainly uh, a, peak, a peak function. And we have the following important result. The special peak functions i sub sigma are characterized as the peak functions whose behavior on the imaginary axis is like this. So in other words, uh, this function in absolute value is bounded by a constant divided by y when y tends to infinity. And here you see my, my favorite mathematician Stilches, uh, who considered these functions uh, in 1894. And uh, <coughs> my reason for going into all this goes 30 years back, because I became fascinated by the so-called indeterminate Hamburger moment problem. Or, uh, what is an indeterminate Hamburger moment sequence, Sn? It's a sequence of numbers uh, which are the moments of a positive measure sigma on the real line. And it's called indeterminate if there is several solutions you can use here as sigma. And that was a discovery of Stilches again in 1894, that uh, sometimes a moment sequence can be uh, uh, determinate. There is exactly one solution to the moments, and sometimes it can be indeterminate if there are several. And then uh, <coughs> in 19 22, Nevenlinner gave a beautiful formula for all the solutions to an indeterminate moment problem. Well, first uh, one defines four entire functions, A, B, C, D. Uh, they are defined in terms of the so-called orthogonal polynomials, which uh, are associated to such a moment sequence. And then for any uh, Herklotz Nevenlinner function, F, or possible a function which is identically infinity, you make this expression, and you can do it outside of the real axis. And it turns out that uh, this is always the Stilges transform of a certain positive measure, uh, depending on this uh, peak function f. And in this way, you get all the solutions to the moment problem. So now I will consider uh, a special class of, uh, of peak functions. If we have a, a closed set A on the real axis, we, we define a subclass of the peak functions N sub A as uh, those peak functions for which there exists a holomorphic function in the whole complex plane, but outside of A, which is the, the peak function in the upper half plane and the corresponding expression in the lower half plane. So in other words, you should be able to, to continue this holomorphic function across the real axis outside of A to, to the other holomorphic expression in the lower half plane. Certainly, if, if such a holomorphic function exists, it must be the limit of the function in the upper half plane like this. And uh, this function can be characterized in the following way. It depends just on the behavior of the measure from the peak function representation. So a peak function belongs to this class if and only if the representing measure has support in the closed set. So remember the principal logarithm. I gave you the integral formula, and the measure was Lebesgue measure on the negative half axis. So therefore, the logarithm belongs to this class n sub minus infinity to zero. Then I will uh, talk a little bit about an another very important uh, use of, uh, of peak functions. If you consider an open interval on the real line from A to B, and a function on this interval with real values, it's called operator monotone. 
if uh, starting with uh, say two self-adjoint operators having their spectrum in the interval, then uh, you can apply the function to the operators, and then it, we require that the inequ inequ this inequality subsists. So in other words, uh, the function should preserve, preserve uh, increasingness of operators uh, with spectrum in the interval. Of course, uh, <coughs> a special case of operators are matrices, and uh, actually Loewner, he proved that for a function to be operator monotone, it's enough to consider n by n matrices of arbitrary size. And in the matrix case, this is uh, something we all know how to define using the diagonalization of the matrices. Loewner proved further that the set of operator monotone functions is exactly this class of pick functions, n sub r minus the interval. So that's the, the, the pick function for which the representing measure is uh, concentrated on r minus this interval. So that's what I would say about peak functions or Herklotz functions. Now I will come to another class of functions, which we met shortly in the lecture by uh, Putin R yesterday. A function on the positive half line is called completely monotonic. If uh, all the derivatives exist and they change sign according to this scheme, so in other words, the function should be non-negative. The first derivative should be negative, and the second derivative positive. So it should be positive, decreasing, and convex functions. And of course, then much more when n is 3, 4, 5, and so on. And there is a beautiful and famous theorem by Bernstein from 28, characterizing exactly the completely monotonic functions is the Laplace transforms of positive measures on the, the positive half line. And the only condition on the positive measure is that the, it, we should be able to integrate these functions uh, for every positive x. Of course, they decrease uh, very quickly, so it's uh, not a big restriction on the measure. The measure need not to be finite, and actually, uh, when you when you go to to zero, the function was decreasing, so this limit exists, and uh, it's equal to the to the total mass of the measure, but that can be infinite. So now, if if you have a function, and you you want to prove it is completely monotonic. Of course, you can just start by differentiating, but usually uh, after three or four differentiations, things become very complicated and you cannot see anything on the derivative unless you are in a very lucky case. Of course, by, by, by Bernstein's uh, Theorem. In principle, you you could try to, to find this expression by Fourier inversion, and I'll come back to that. But that can also be very complicated. Now there is a a class of uh, completely monotonic functions which is very useful, and uh, they are called Stilts functions because they were also considered by Stilts but it's not exactly the same as Stilts transforms. Now, a Stilts function is one on the positive half line, which can be expressed in this way, a non-negative constant plus this integral with respect to a positive measure on the half line, just such that uh, you can integrate all these expressions when x is positive. So, 
this is a condition of the measure mu in order that you can uh, write this formula. One, one can note that these functions are the Laplace transforms of some mass at zero plus uh, the Laplace transform of mu considered as a function on this half line as a density with respect to the back measure. So essentially, a stiltest function is uh, something which is a double Laplace transform of a positive measure. And now the set of stiltest functions is a convex subcone of the completely monotonic functions. Here you see uh, the Ukrainian mathematician Bernstein. And uh, the stiltest functions can be characterized by complex analysis. And now we see the connection to the Herklov Nevenender functions. It's a theorem which is usually attributed to, to Crane. And it says the following if you have a function on the positive half line, then it is a stiltest function in, in the sense that uh, it has such an integral representation like this. If and only if it's uh, non negative on the positive half line and it should have a holomorphic extension to the cut plane, satisfying that the imaginary part now is negative in the other half plane. So you can also say that it should be a function which is non-negative for positive values and uh, minus the function should be a peak function. So now let me give you some examples of Stiltes functions. Uh, if you have one, then uh, one divided by f at one over x is a Stiltes function. And that's immediately from, uh, from Crane's uh, theorem. This is more complicated that you have a Stiltes function, then one divided by x times the function is again a Stiltes function. And this is an important property which has been useful in many, many uh, uh, different areas of mathematics. And then it has been dis discovered by uh, many different mathematicians because they needed it in their, in their work. So uh, a, a British mathematician, Reuter, proved it uh, in 56. He had to use it in uh, a study of integral equations. and. Uh, a young Japanese mathematician, not the famous Ito, but another Ito, uh, he proved it in connection with uh, potential theory. But actually, all, already Stiltes noticed it. But uh, it was just something he mentioned uh, in his letters to, to Amit. If you consider uh, x to the minus alpha, where alpha is a positive number. So then, then it's easy to see that it's completely monotonic, because whenever you differentiate, you get a negative factor in front, and then you get the change of signs. But it's only a, a stiltes function, precisely when the number alpha is between uh, 0 and 1. Let me give you another function, which uh, I will talk more about in, in a few minutes. We already saw this expression. And it turns out that this is a Stiltes uh, function having this uh, very special representation. So the constant in front is 0. And this is uh, the density of the non-negative measure. And uh, this is valid for alpha between 0 and, and 1. So in this case, uh, when c runs from 0 to 1, this is less than pi, so the sign is non-negative, and this is certainly also non-negative. So you can say that this function is, completely mo is a stiltest function, and then also a completely monotonic function when alpha is between 0 and 1. 
And you can imagine if you want to differentiate this 10 times, it will be terrible. Now there is still another class of functions which is related to the to the peak functions, so-called positive operator monotone functions on this half line. So if you have a function on the positive half line with non-negative values, then three conditions are equivalent. It can be extended to a peak function in the class n sub minus infinity to zero. Uh, so, so these are the the operator monotone functions by Loebner. Equivalently, it has an integral representation of this form, where alpha is non-negative and sigma is a positive measure. And uh, if you divide the function by x, it's a Stiltz function. Now, these functions have become very important, so there's even written a, a full book about them. And in this book, they are called complete Bernstein functions. Uh, this is a, a wonderful monograph by uh, uh, René Schilling and, uh, and two others, uh, and he in introduced them uh, in his thesis about Levy processes. So you see also uh, our functions, peak, Herklotz, Nemalina, come in in Levy processes. So now I will, will speak about uh, the work done together with the two people from Brazil. And uh, let me start with something which we more or less learned in, in high school, that this function 1 plus 1 over x to the power alpha x, it increases from 1 to e to the power alpha when x tends to infinity. And it's a small exercise to prove that the function is concave if and only if alpha is less than this number. And this, uh, let me suppose the, the, the question, for which positive alpha is uh, is this uh, function H alpha prime completely monotonic? And, and looking at graphs, again, because it was difficult to differentiate, suggested that, uh, that the answer should be some interval from zero up to a number alpha star, which was between two and three. But we, we didn't know or we didn't understand what this alpha star is. And several people worked on that during uh, 20 years and came up with various approximations. But then finally, in, in this work by Massa and, and Perron and myself, we characterized the alpha star and we, we could actually calculate it with as many decimals, decimals as we wanted, but we thought that 20 was enough. So, we, so here are the approximation to alpha star with, uh, with 20 decimals. And this is based on harmonic analysis and complex analysis. So now, for any complex number alpha, we consider this uh, function of a complex variable 1 plus 1 over z to the power alpha z, defined as uh, as this expression where we use uh, the principal logarithm, which is defined in, in the cut plane. And uh, again, as before, also for complex values, uh, when set in absolute value tends to infinity, this function h sub alpha approaches the exponential of alpha. And uh, so we look at, at this function, which is now defined in the cut plane, where we remove the negative axis, and alpha is an arbitrary complex number. 
So the question is, for which non-negative alpha is this function a completely monotonic function? And uh, as I already told you, uh, Elsa and myself proved in 2002 that it's a stiltless function, hence completely monotonic when alpha is between 0 and 1. So now, uh, the idea was to try to find some functions, phi sub alpha, such that the Laplace transform of this function is our given function f alpha. So if you could find these functions, the, the question was reduced to, to find out when are these functions phi sub alpha non-negative. And uh, it turns out that before an inversion, we can give these functions as a contour integral. Uh, and we integrate over a rectangle, CRC, uh, depending on a number C bigger than 1 and a positive number R. And that is really the rectangle with corners minus C plus IR and plus IR. Consider it as a closed contour. M maybe I, I should just... Uh, are there chalk somewhere? So this is, uh, this is the contour, and uh, actually the, the value of this contour integral is independent of, of where c is to the left of uh, a minus 1, and uh, independent of how big the positive number r is. This is just from the Cauchy formula. The first thing we should notice is that our function is actually holomorphic outside of this, uh, this cut from minus 1 to 0. And that's why it was independent of... Uh, uh, I mean, because of holomorphy, you can, you can move these points and you can move it up and down. And why, why is it so? Well, if we consider a function g sub alpha, where we replace z by 1 over z, we get this expression, and, in the, in, uh, and we have a power series of this uh, function given like this. So, so this expression really shows that if you define g alpha as 0 as 0, it's a holomorphic function in the unit disk, and uh, th this expression is then the holomorphic extension uh, to this cut plane. And then <coughs> we can prove that uh, the power series of this, uh, of this function in the unit disk is given like this, where Pn of alpha is a, a sequence of polynomials in alpha. And I will explain what they are next. Well, they can simply be defined uh, by putting p0 equal 1, p1 is alpha over 2, and so on. And then we have a recursion formula. So we, if we know the first n polynomials, then the next one is given by this formula. And uh, it turns out that it's a polynomial starting from alpha up to alpha power n with strictly positive coefficients. and uh, the first one and the last one are, are simple, and the rest can be expressed in terms of Stirling numbers, but, but that's quite complicated. Well, it, it depends on a, a formula in combinatorics. If you take the exponential of a power series, it's again a, 
a power series and the coefficients are, are so-called Bell exponential polynomials. And again, they're given by a recursion formula. If we know the, the Bell partition polynomials, for the first number of variables, we get the next one by this recursion formula. And, and this will actually give us that uh, our polynomials Pn of alpha are, are these expressions where these uh, uh, coefficients a1 up to an are, are given by, by these simple expressions. Yeah. So now we, we consider uh, our function f alpha on the imaginary axis. And it, it can be written like this. Uh, but when y is zero, we, we have to take the limit, which is this. And it turns out to be a continuous function, which belongs to L2, but not to L1. And I, I will not go into the proof of this. Uh, but since it's an L2 function, it's actually the, the Plancherel transform of another L2 function. I call it T sub alpha. And uh, I mean, by Plancherel theorem, uh, we have an isometry of L2 onto L2. And uh, so the, the function T sub alpha is uh, inverse Fourier transform of this function f sub alpha on the imaginary axis. But now, if we use that this function is holomorphic in the right half plane, then by a contour integration, to integrate over this interval from minus r to r, this the same as to integrate the function uh, over a half circle in the right half plane. And since uh, this expression can be bounded by this, uh, we get the conclusion that uh, the function g sub alpha is actually zero uh, when, when s is less than zero. So we arrive at uh, that these functions phi sub alpha, uh, they're actually entire functions because you integrate over a compact contour. And it has these uh, power series. And uh, uh, and this function, uh, if you take the, the entire function phi sub alpha, on the positive half line, and then put it to zero on the negative half line. This is actually equal to our function g sub alpha, whose Fourier transform was uh, the function phi sub alpha. So now we, uh, we use that the function was holomorphic, except for this cut. And, uh, the function was originally given as an integral over this uh, green rectangle. But then we can add an integral along this quarter circle, which is zero. And we can add an integral along this quarter circle, which is also zero. And then we can add an integral along this quarter circle, uh, this uh, rectangle, which is also zero. So this means that the integral over this small rectangle is the same as the integral over this big contour. And then again, one can prove that the integral along this contour will tend to zero when r tends to infinity. So we end up by having the function as an integral over this vertical line. Well, first, uh, this was the integral over a part of the imaginary axis, and this was the integral along this, uh, this curved part in the left half plane. 
And uh, when R tends to infinity, this will go away. And uh, this means that, that we finally get the, the right power search expansion of uh, our function. I'll not go into detail. Now, these polynomials in alpha, we could ask if they are a so-called Stilts moment sequencer. If they are the moments of some measure sigma alpha. And then, if this is true, then uh, we get that the function phi sub alpha is actually the Laplace transform of this measure. And, and this leads to the following theorem. The following conditions are equivalent. Our polynomials at the, at the point alpha is a stilts moment sequence, even only if the function is completely monotonic, but unfortunately, even only if alpha is between 0 and 1. So uh, it does not give uh, more results than the previous formula by Alsa and myself. Uh, for the Stilts function case. And uh, this was our control integral. And if we let R tend to zero, so we, we squeeze this to an integral twice along the real axis. And then also, uh, and we keep alpha between 0 and 1, one can see that this will converge to, to this expression. So, so that's how uh, we obtained the formula with, with alpha. But it's only for alpha strictly less than 1. If you let alpha tend to 1, there will uh, emerge some expression from a singularity. So that will give us a special term in, in front. And, uh, this expression, when alpha tends to 1, just reduces to this expression. Of course, you would be tempted to say, why don't you do this for alpha bigger than 1 also? But when alpha is, uh, is bigger than 1, then first of all, uh, this sine function will, uh, will then be negative on certain part of the interval. But also, uh, uh, there is a singularity at 1, and when alpha is bigger than 1, uh, this singularity is then not non-integrable. So uh, the middle formula here will have no sense when alpha is bigger than 1. Now, if we look at our power series for phi alpha, and we have the expression for the coefficients, then it is possible to let alpha tend to zero when we have divided by this, and we get a very simple expression outside. So this function will be p zero if and only if one plus s times e to the minus s is one. But, but there are no real solutions. There are no positive solutions to this equation, but there are always complex solutions. And they can be expressed by a, a very special function called the Lambert W function. I mean, it, it's a very old thing. Lambert was the one who proved that pi is irrational so in 17 something. And he also looked at this. Uh, look at solutions uh, of, of such an equation. Uh, and later, this function was called the Lambert function. I will not go into detail with this. But uh, recall that there is also a well-known Bessel function, which is much more known. Uh, there is one called j sub 1, having this power series expansion. and. Uh, it's, it's known that it has uh, only real zeros given like this. 
And these numbers are very well known in analysis. Uh, So this means that, uh, roughly speaking, our functions uh, uh, phi sub alpha, they are close to the Lambert function when alpha is small, and they are close to the Bessel function j1 when alpha is, is big. And that really explains uh, when this function phi alpha will be non-negative, which was our goal. Uh, so let me then tell you what, what we, we know. We, we found this number alpha star, where the function first becomes uh, uh, non-negative. So when alpha is strictly less than that, the function phi alpha is always strictly positive. When alpha is this boundary value alpha star, then the function is non-negative and it's actually strictly positive except, except at a certain point s star, which we also calculated, where it has a double zero. And then when alpha passes this alpha star, then this function will have a finite number of positive zeros. Uh, and the bigger alpha is, the more zeros it will have because they will, will approach these zeros of the Bessel function. And uh, we, we can see it on, on these graphs uh, where I've drawn the graph of phi sub alpha. Let's consider these values 0 0.8, 1, and 1.2. So uh, that's where the function should, should be uh, positive. Uh, of course, it looks like that. The first two functions. That's when alpha is less than or equal to 1. They are actually completely monotonic functions. But the next one is not completely monotonic. But of course, <laughs> you cannot see it on the graph. So let's go on with further values. Uh, 2.1 and 2.2, that's still below uh, the alpha star. So there are the functions are still non-negative, but when we reach alpha star, it just bumps down to the real axis at this point as star, and then it goes up and then decreases to infinity. But when we pass the critical point alpha star, it, it goes down under the axis and then up again. So now it has two zeros, and then it becomes positive and decreases the zero. For these values, uh, yeah, you see that the first zero moves to the left. So the first zero is actually a decreasing function. But now, when we uh, have alpha equal to almost six, so then it has two zeros, it goes down and then it goes up again, and then it comes down and then there's a certain point where it, it has a, a minimum and zero and then it goes up and decreases to zero. And then if we uh, take other values of, uh, of alpha 9, 11, and 13, you, you see that uh, now there now there comes uh, several zeros uh, and uh, for alpha equals say forty, it has many zeros uh, and. Uh, here I've just multiplied the function with, with a factor so we can, can better see. I mean, it's, the, the red curve, it cuts the axis there and there and it goes a little bit below. But now when we scale it, uh, it's, it's more clear that uh, 
But again, we cannot really see if it goes below, but if you scale it even more, we can see that uh, now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros, and so on. So, uh, uh, I'm sure all of you know this wonderful book about uh, our class of functions. That's where I first learned about it. This book by Donahue. And he called it monotone matrix functions, an analytic continuation. And, uh, and this is my work with Massa and Peron. And this is a book by, by Schilling about complete Bernstein functions, which is also a, a book about the Herklotz Nemanjela function in a special case. Okay, thank you for your attention. Yeah.